Ancient Aliens is one of those shows that I loved back when I was in middle school, early high school. It was one of those shows that as a kid I thought that what they were claiming made sense. It appealed to my sensibilities of believing in the unknown and supernatural by portraying these academic professionals backing up the ancient alien theory. I then sort of fell out of it, life moved on, until fairly recently when I rediscovered the show and found out that it was still airing new episodes. As of making this video, there are almost 150 episodes that make up 13 seasons. I watched one episode, then another one, then several more, and I realized that a lot of their theories were absolute bananas. It's the most black and white thinking and flawed logic I had ever seen. I decided to make this video as a way to show how easily refutable their evidence is. I'm not the first one to do this nor will I be the last. There are multiple people running blogs and podcasts on the subject. There's even a feature length documentary on YouTube called Ancient Aliens Debunked which examines the show's early episodes that had more of a focus on the ancient world and they do a really good job of breaking down why a lot of their claims are false. In this video, what I want to examine is how Ancient Aliens tries to tie alien visitors with events that happened 200 years ago, which is fairly more recent in the scale of things. I'm going to be looking at two segments from two different episodes of Ancient Aliens and show you the way that they easily manipulate information. In the season premiere episode of season 3 called Aliens in the Old West, they take a look at one of the most popular UFO crashes that occurred in Aurora, Texas in 1897. This incident was reported by S.C. E. Hayden in the Dallas Morning News. He describes how an airship had hit a windmill in Judge J.S. Proctor's home and the airship promptly crashed and exploded causing the debris of the ship to sparse throughout the acres of land. A local reporter arrived on the scene. He reported that there was a large debris field and also that there was the charred remains of what appeared to be, to him, uh, an alien from another planet. And the occupant, described as unworldly by witnesses, was given a Christian burial and put in an unmarked grave. What the show doesn't mention is the following paragraph of the article that talks about a T.J. Weems, a signal service officer and astronomer who seemed to definitively conclude that the pilot was a native from the planet Mars. The series doesn't talk about Weems or include his claims because it makes the article seem like some type of hokey sci-fi parody. Which it was. In the years of 1896 through 1897, there was a surge of eyewitness accounts throughout the United States who reported seeing strange lights and a mysterious airship. This trend of people reporting strange lights and airships flying over them arrived to Texas and journalists had a field day with this. One newspaper article during this time reported that a sky monster had landed on the roof of someone's home in Dallas. A Fort Worth resident claimed he saw several men around a cigar-shaped craft who said they were on their way to bomb Cuba and had stopped for gas. It's been agreed for a while that Hayden was one of these people who told a tall tale during this time. In fact, his article was in the front page of the Dallas Morning News along with other UFO stories that were picked up by the editors of the paper. That's why there was no mass hysteria or people rushing to Aurora to see it when it was first reported. So why did Hayden tell this story? Well, you see, Aurora had befallen a couple of unfortunate events up to that point. Firstly, the town's major revenue source, Cotton, had been destroyed by a beetle infestation. Then there was a fire on the town's west side that destroyed buildings and took lives. After that, there was a spotted fever epidemic that claimed a lot of the lives of the remaining population. To top that off, a railroad that was being built missed Aurora by 30 miles. Needless to say, Aurora was a dying town, and businessmen like Hayden and Judge Proctor wanted to bring attention to the town. It was also discovered by a ufologist by the name of Kevin Randall, who went to investigate the crash in the early 70s before the media frenzy got there that T.J. Weem was the local blacksmith who would also have been affected by the town's dwindling population. 
The newspaper article goes on to say that there was going to be a Christian burial, yet there is no official record of this burial taking place or a follow-up article on the papers that describe the burial. You would think that a burial of a man who fell from the sky would gather more attention or there would be more people remembering this. There wasn't even some sort of death certificate. When Randall went to investigate this issue, he was greeted with a lot of people who claimed that nothing had happened. But once the media had gotten a hold of the story in the mid to late 70s, people began to change their tune. I wonder why. Ancient Alien gives us two possibilities about what happened with the debris from the crash. Witnesses claimed that debris from the crash was recovered by local law enforcement and never seen again. Yet, a woman who in 1897 was 12 years old recalls that her father, a constable of the area, had roared with laughter after reading the article and said that Judge Proctor had really outdone himself this time taking the article to be what it was, nothing more than a joke. The second theory that the show gives us on the whereabouts of the flying ship. Others claim that Judge Proctor buried it at the bottom of a deep well. Were to believe that Proctor had the smoking gun, the remains of the spaceship that could prove the existence of extraterrestrials. He had this miraculous evidence that landed on his property, which could possibly identify from where this person slash life form came from, and he just decided to throw it away in as well. Decades, the incident remained largely forgotten, until in 1945, a man named Brawley Oates, who had purchased Proctor's land, reportedly was cleaning out the debris from the well, when he later developed an extremely severe case of arthritis, which he claimed to be the result of the contaminated water. I'm not gonna lie, that's a pretty bad case of arthritis. His hands are essentially disfigured. From the research I've done, it seems like you can get arthritis from an infection, but considering that the water from the well was tested and only traces of aluminum could be found, I doubt that that would have caused that much of a severe arthritis infection. It could have also easily been some sort of pre-existing condition due to disease or wear and tear of the joints. We find that people who are using that well actually get ill. Ancient alien theorists claim that the water affected many people, but the only person that they show and that I could find that got sick from it was this man named Oates. If it had been this harmful, wouldn't someone who handled the material like Proctor or the other police officers or even T.J. Weems also have gotten affected by it? In fact, after Proctor moved out of his property, there's no longer any mention of him or his family in this account. Ancient Aliens then has Jim Mars, who was most likely their main consultant for this case, since he has heavily written about this in his book, Alien Agenda. He says this. I first got on to the uh, Aurora story back in 1973 and was uh, there before the tombstone went missing and actually probably one of the few people around who still remember where the actual grave site was. Now the little grave is located right here. It was a short little grave. That of a child or a very small person. And the two little headstone, the marker, was right about there. Except that Randall had gone to the cemetery years prior and had walked the entirety of the plot of land looking for evidence of where this body might have been buried. He saw no tombstone that resembled what Jim Mars is talking about, especially not in the area where it was later said to have been. He also mentions that every resident of Aurora that he spoke to all seemed to agree that this was a hoax. That is, until news channel outlets and prolific ufologists, including Jim Mars, along with camera crews came around, that several townspeople began changing their tune. Jim Mars then goes on to say that Scientists with ground penetrating radar established that there really had been a short grave here. Now back in 1973, Bill Case was the aviation writer for the Dallas Times Herald. I was working for the Star-Telegram. When we met up here, he had a metal detector. And we found three readings of metal in the grave. A couple of months after the headstone went missing, Bill invited me to meet him up here. We went over the grave and there was no readings in the grave. He showed me three little holes that had been drilled in the grave. Someone had extracted the middle out of the grave. In regards to the missing headstone, the graveyard was constantly being visited by hundreds of visitors 
It won't be far off to say that a headstone that looked like this could have been conveniently carried off by a UFO fanatic or by town officials trying to discourage others from digging up the supposed grave. Another journalist who had gone to Aurora fairly recently said that when he talked to government officials had told him that the marker was still there. Researchers wanted to exhume the body, but uh, the local cemetery association uh, wouldn't let them. Uh, my first question is, why not? What's it going to hurt? As a historian, it makes me suspicious when somebody's trying to hide something from you or tells you you can't, you can't do something. The series makes it seem like there's this big conspiracy about why the town of Aurora doesn't want to dig up the grave. But there's a couple of reasons why I believe the town is constantly denying the request. For one, people are uncomfortable with the idea of the resting place of their loved ones being disturbed over something that may or may not be be there. Secondly, and this was reported by a journalist who went there fairly recently, there's actually someone buried in that unmarked grave and it's reported that the family reached out to the committee requesting for the grave not to be disturbed and asked for privacy. So did Jim Mars stumble across an unmarked grave of a poor soul and try to pass it off as there being an alien buried there years before and probably had no connection with this UFO story? These two reasons make sense. The committee made this decision based on the general consensus of the town and because they probably know that there isn't anything extraterrestrial in that cemetery. In this case, there isn't some big government cover up to hide the existence of aliens, just the town government who doesn't want to anger the residents to appease some ufologists. In this episode, Jim Mars doesn't talk about his belief that federal government agents had visited the cemetery. I'm not sure if this was left in the cutting room floor or something. Here's a clip of him talking about this in the Coast to Coast radio show. Later, I met a woman uh, and something came up about the uh, spaceman buried in the Aurora Cemetery. And she says, uh, uh, she said, oh, yeah, it says, uh, said, you know, as a little girl, I used to go play over there and says, I ran into government agents in that graveyard. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I said, okay, yeah, I said, that was probably in the early 70s, right, thinking she was referring to the time I was there investigating. She said, no, this was back in the 50s. So, see, there's been government uh, uh, interest in that uh, uh, ever since the 50s. Now, what this segment shows me is that Jim R. seems to take anecdotal witness accounts as evidence if it fits his narrative. He uses these accounts as part to argue for the validity of the Aurora case. He doesn't question this particular woman or the story that she feeds him. I think in cases like this where there's little evidence in regards to the validity of a story, you should question all the evidence you get before making conclusions off of them. In 1897, this was six years before the Wright brothers actually made heavier than air craft work. So uh, this is why I consider the Aurora spaceship crash the smoking gun of the UFO controversy because this occurred six years before there was anything man-made in the air. Jim Mars caused the Aurora crash the smoking gun in part because it happened six years before the Wright brothers successfully flew a heavier than air craft. Again, this isn't entirely true. The idea of flight had been around since the time of Da Vinci and probably before that, who he himself was trying to create a flying machine. He outlined blueprints for aircrafts and even created models for gliders. Around the time of the Aurora crash, there was a race to create heavier than air flying machines and even the US government sanctioned various scientists to create the first successful aircraft. There's even some debate of whether or not the Wright brothers were the first ones to fly a flying machine, as in other countries such as Brazil, they believe that Santos Dumont was the first one to fly a powered flying machine. Aviation wasn't created by the Wright brothers or by one person, it was the accumulation of decades of research, equations, and aerial designs from various sources. For J. Mars to give validity to the Aurora UFO crash because the Wright brothers hadn't yet flown their aircraft is a grossly misinformed statement. I was going to entertain the idea that maybe a man-made aircraft had crashed. But first off, someone would have come looking for the man flying or there would have been reports of a disappearance. And there's also no debris or body to back up this conclusion. So I don't think there was any sort of flying aircraft that day. 
The truth is that the only first-hand evidence we have of this happening is a newspaper article written by Hayden, who was known to write humoristic essays. With all this evidence to the contrary, why does the story refuse to die? Well, because ufologists constantly try to use this as evidence of alien contact with humans and shows like ancient aliens give them a platform and encourage them to continue spreading this misinformation. The second segment I want to talk about is from the episode Aliens and Founding Fathers where they speculate on the idea that the Founding Fathers of the United States had some sort of contact with aliens. We know this. We know this because an aide to General Washington lived to be over a hundred years old told this story to a newspaper of our first general having an alien encounter. Could George Washington really have had an extraterrestrial visitation at Valley Forge? They use an article called Washington's Visions as proof which in it describes an encounter with Washington and a heavenly being. Some believe it was a strange vision he received during a moment of prayer. In a moment of absolute misery, he went off into the woods to pray. And there in the forest, he had this magnificent vision of a creature garbed in white. And this creature, call it an extraterrestrial, call it a heavenly spirit, but it was an otherworldly presence. Whenever ancient alien experts hear the word heavenly or any of these types of keywords, they have automatically made it synonymous with extraterrestrial life. Laid out for Washington the victory that the Continental Army would have in the Revolutionary War against the British and laid out the history of the new United States of America. A model of how the United States would look a hundred or two hundred years in the future. Except that this encounter never happened, although there are conflicting reports of the existence of Anthony Sherman, the general consensus seems to be that there was a soldier with the last name of Sherman, but in 1777 he was stationed in Saratoga, nowhere near Washington and his forces who were in Valley Forge at the time. Also look at it logically, if this majestic vision did occur of Washington getting inside information about the course of the United States future in the next 200 years, wouldn't he have written it somewhere or told the other founding fathers about this? Maybe have made the amendments less vague or have made a stronger push of no political parties? Instead when we do hear from this it's from a journalist named Charles Wesley Alexander who supposedly heard this from a 99 year old Sherman who had supposedly overheard Washington telling one of his officers about this. The article was written during the start of the Civil War by Charles Alexander who had also written about visions and dreams of other historic American figures as a way to inspire citizens from the Union States to join the army. That's why Alexander made the figure who appeared to Washington make references to the Union and the Republic. He had also written other articles about female Union soldiers with supernatural powers and made the claims that the Confederacy had a demonic English woman working for them. They were meant to be patriotic propaganda and his intentions were clear to his audience at the time. The intentions seemed to have been modeled by time and for some reason people try to pass this off in part because the newspaper can be found in the Library of Congress. And if you know how the Library of Congress works, just because it's there doesn't mean it's real or a true account or that the United States is giving some sort of validity to it. Ancient aliens and by extension the History Channel doesn't care about facts or reality. They'll pass this story off as being factual and claim that aliens gave the Founding Fathers information just for the sake of making an episode. I think this claim very much undermines Washington's leadership because at the time people believed that the colonies would lose and it shows the faith that Washington had on his troops and the ideals of the colonies that he was fighting for. If he had knowledge of the future as ancient aliens speculate then it would undermine the struggles that he went through. I know that based off of my other video where I questioned Zach Bagan's involvement in a possession case where there were clear mental health issues and the children involved 
people are gonna try to write me off as a skeptic and close-minded in the comment sections of this video if it gets any traction and frankly I'm not a skeptic I think there's a difference between believing in the supernatural paranormal and questioning the validity of the evidence used in shows like ancient aliens Neither the History Channel nor Ancient Aliens have really given any statements in regards to this. I can speculate that they would say something along the lines of the viewers themselves can do their own research and that this show is purely speculation. Well, the average viewer might not have the time to do their own research and assume that a network that calls itself the History Channel would vet shows like Ancient Aliens and fact check their information before giving them platform. Naturally, there are people who do acknowledge the pandering logic and false statements made by the show, but still watch it due to the entertainment value, which is completely fine. But there are those who hold this show up high like if it were their gospel and in such high regards that when the History Channel tried to haul the show to H2, the network had no choice but to bring it back when the reruns on the main channel were getting more views than the new episodes being aired on H2. Too. After all, money does talk. I think though that there's a question of culpability. When do we have to ask then who's to blame? The show? The network? The ufologists? The ancient alien theorists? Well, at the end of the day, no one really. These ufologists and ancient alien theorists have the freedom to say whatever they want. But that means that we also have the freedom to analyze what they say and call them out if we deem it appropriate. Not believing every evidence presented to us does not make us skeptics. We as believers should be our own worst critics. After all, if we want to present conclusions, then the framework or evidence that these conclusions stand on should be firm and hard to knock down. If we present cases like the Aurora UFO crash or Washington's visions as support for beliefs in aliens, then the skeptics will have a field day poking the obvious holes in these accounts that the foundation of our conclusions will fall, making the actual good evidence that is used also be brought down. In this way, ancient aliens is harmful. By trying to present every piece of supposed evidence under the sun as proof, then they will lower the credibility of the field and it will be harder for the actual evidence to be seen as proof. This is why we as viewers should stay vigilant and hold those that have a platform accountable of what they say and how they say it. And uh, yeah, that was the video. This one took me a while to make, so if you like it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, feel free to give it a thumbs down and also leave a comment down below if you agree or disagree with me. I'll see you all in the next one.